everybody. Welcome back. And this is Paul Kengor, your host for this regular podcast series, which we've been doing monthly for TAN Books. And we've done several of these now. We had Bob Moynihan, Carrie Grass, among others. And today we've got a special guest, Patrick O'Hearn, who is the who's the editor. He's the new editor for TAN Books. And he's also an author. He's got this great new book called called Parents of the Saints. And and let me tell you that you know just just because this is sponsored by Tan and he's the editor, no one asked me to do this. I I heard about this book, I read this book, and I and I said I said Patrick, we got we got to have you on to talk about this. He's very humble, as you'll see, and he's probably thinking, oh, why would anybody even want me on the show? Why would anybody want to want to hear about this book? But it's important, and it's it's a it's a very good book. So Patrick, welcome. Good to have you here. Thank you, Paul. It's a pleasure to be here. So let's, before we talk about the book, tell us, tell us about yourself. You've got a very interesting story. I mean, one of the things that, that I like to focus on in these podcasts that the Tan Books is all about is making mm-hmm. people saints and, you know, bringing people into the church. And, you know, this is, you know, above all, of course, first and foremost, a Catholic publishing house. So we're interested in people's spiritual paths and backgrounds. So so tell us where you're from and you know, where you came from. Tell us a little bit about how you got to where you are now. Sure, sure thing. Yep. So I uh, so I was actually born in uh, Bismarck, North Dakota, uh, and I'm the youngest of three three boys. And so my, my dad's job, my dad worked uh, for John Deere, and we kind of got transferred around a lot and ended up spending about 18 years in Illinois, and then um, when my dad retired, we ended up moving to Ohio. Both my parents are from Ohio. And so then uh, when I was in Ohio for a few years, and, and then I uh, ended up joining a Benedictine monastery for about three years, kind of discerned my vocation there. And then uh, eventually God led me out of that vocation. And then I went to a Franciscan University in Steubenville, and I was doing some graduate work there and I met my, my lovely wife there. And then uh, kind of end up in North Carolina, where I'm, I'm currently at. Kind of, uh, so I'm blessed with uh, one son, and then we have uh, two children in heaven. And uh, then through God's providence, you know, I just uh, this this position, uh, you know, working for Tan, it opened up. I had uh, started a publishing company uh, called Contemplative Heart Press, where I've done a few books on miscarriage and a, a children's book, and um, so just really an answer to prayer. To, uh, to work at TAN. I've always admired um, TAN books as a young boy, read the lives of the saints. And uh, so just, I was kind of praying a novena to Our Lady. And, uh, you know, and that's how this uh, position came up. Um, really, it was kind of miraculous to, to have this role. And uh, so that, that's kind of a little bit about me. Um, All right. Well, there, okay. There's a lot there. So, <laughs> Um, <laughs> uh, so you you end up in Illinois. Uh, were you in Peoria? Yeah. I'm guessing maybe. Yeah, I, I was. At, I was actually in uh, Moline, Illinois, so an hour and a half from from Peoria. Okay. And uh, you know, actually, in, in, in this book, Parents of the Saints, you know, I talk about uh, Venerable Fulton Sheen's parents. Exactly. You know, I, I love Fulton. Sheen. Love Fulton Sheen. Uh, so, how, are you? Um, have you spent some time in Peoria? I, I have, and I'm going to be there yeah, again yeah. in August. Yeah, and I've been to El Paso, Illinois, which is the tiny little town that Fulton Sheen is from. And that whole area, I've got kind of a shameless self promotion in the background there. Ronald Reagan and John Paul II, one of my books, A Pope and a President. Ronald Reagan and Fulton Sheen both came from that same area. And I gave a talk at the right. Peoria Museum. Peoria, um, it's Peoria Riverfront Museum, which is run by my good friend John Morris, who ran the Ronald Reagan Society at Eureka College. Eureka College is the one of the was okay. Ronald Reagan College, and I gave a talk there on Fulton Sheen and Ronald Reagan in that area. And you'll appreciate this, Patrick. But the I remember giving a talk to a Legatus group, I think, or, or some Catholic group in Philadelphia, and talking to this big group about Fulton Sheen about Fulton Sheen, I gave the talk on Fulton Sheen and Ronald Reagan, same talk I gave in Peoria. And um, this guy comes up to me from Philly and he's, you know, kind of a tough Philly guy. And he says, hey, you know, we think we're so cool here from the Northeast and everything, but here you got the two greatest communicators of the 20th century, a priest and a president. And they both come from like little Northwestern towns in Illinois, right? And so, so yeah, that's, um, that that area has some amazing history. People don't appreciate it. 
and it, you get in your car and drive through it. It's all completely flat. And, mm-hmm. and, and yet you had people there like Fulton Sheen that, that end up major celebrities, <laughs> right? He was a celebrity priest. But, but indeed, yeah, I know that you, that you wrote about him here. So that's one thing I want to ask you about. The, so Illinois, you end up, you end up Franciscan first and then the Benedictines, right? Oh, oh, oh sorry, the, the Benedictines first, and then okay, I yeah, discerned I on it. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So, I, so I joined the Benedictines right out of, you know, I spent a year working in a, a large community to help with people's special needs. I lived in their home, kind of took care of them. And, uh, and then after that year, then I, you know, was, uh, there's a monastery close by and uh, went there. And then after about, I was about there three years, I felt the Lord saying, you know, this isn't your, your calling. And, you know, it was kind of difficult for me because I always thought I would, I kind of thought I'd be like a hidden brother for the rest of my life. That was kind of like my goal. I, I love like blessed Andre who I, or St. Andre who I talk about in here and, you know, it's in it, how God kind of, sometimes he changes our desires and a lot of these saints too in the, in the book that uh, we'll get to in a second, I'm sure you are mentioned, but you know, how like St. Therese's parents, they wanted to be religious and God had another plan. So, yeah. So after the monastery, I ended up going to um, Franciscan university. Can, can you say where the monastery was or would you rather not? Does yeah. That... Yeah. Yeah. No, it was uh, St. Andrew Abbey in Cleveland. Okay. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. And so three years there. And so yeah. you decided ultimately that that wasn't your calling, right? And that's and right. So you went to Franciscan, which our last guest, Carrie Gress, as well, right? Went to went to Franciscan. Yep. Um, Franciscan. I have a son, yep. at Franciscan currently in, in the master's program. So so you were there for four years, bachelor's degree? You know, actually I did so I master's of education. So okay. I was there about uh, about two years. So Okay. All right. And you yeah. and you met your wife there as well? I did, yep. Okay. And then, and then, so after that, did you go straight into publishing? Did you start your own? You know, I did. I actually, so I went into, uh, I went, I was a school, I actually worked with high functioning autistic students. So I have an aunt with down syndrome and I've always loved people with special needs. I went, I went there teaching. I love teaching. And then I realized I really, you know, with, with student debt and uh, being a teacher, you know, it was, it was really difficult. I, you know, we wanted to have a family. And so right. Right. then I went, my under my undergrads in marketing, I, I went to uh, St. Ambrose University in Iowa. And so, so I kind of went with my business background I see. and uh, went back into, into sales for about five years. And then in the meantime, while I was doing sales, I was, I was writing, I would spend most of my evenings, you know, it was kind of really the Holy Spirit gave me a gift for writing. Cause you know, I, I was, I was joking. It's like the two things I've dreaded the most in life were speaking and writing huh. and somehow God, God kind of like, he's like, okay, well, you know, I, I want, if I have a mission for you, I'm going to give you that gift. Um, sure. So, so I kind of, I would do as I was working on sales in the evenings, I'd come home and pretty much stay up late, just writing books. And uh, so that's, See, see what, is, what does that tell you, right? I've had that conversation yeah. with students before who, who say I'm an engineering major or uh, you know, I'm a marketing major, but but I just want to write, right? I just want to study yeah. theology. I just want to, and I said, well, you know, maybe maybe that's maybe that's what you should do. And the, and the hesitation, Patrick, is always, well, there's no money in that, right? Um, how can I raise yeah. a family doing that? Or what will yeah. my parents say, right? Or my parents want me to be a doctor or a lawyer. Um, but if, if that's what you're, if that's what you're called to do now, it's interesting that you said writing is writing hard for you. Do you not enjoy it? Or you kind of do? No, yeah. You know, growing up, I, I didn't really like it as much, but now, now I love to do it. Um, and I feel, I, I find it very humbling in my role to, when I get, um, you know, manuscripts and I do mostly, you know, I'm, I'm doing, uh, not so much the copy editing, but the developmental editing. And, uh, and, you know, a lot of times I'm, I'm looking at a, a manuscript from someone that has like yourself that has a PhD or a master's and, you know, and I, I give suggestions and then we take it to the copy editor who looks more at the grammar, but, but it's, it's almost like, you know, like I think when in, in a role of being a priest or you're kind of like, you feel like unworthy of the role, but you know, somehow God has chosen you, you know, to do this role. And so you have to just, you know, you constantly are trying to get better each day and just pray for that grace to do a good job, uh, well, hey, I, I can tell you, having the PhD after your name doesn't mean that you're a good writer. It is, <laughs> I mean, it, <laughs> every, everybody everybody needs editors. And, and also, too, PhD often means that you've just gone to a college for uh, graduate work and specialized yeah. in something really, 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 really narrow. 
right? Sure. Um, but but everybody, every good writer is, you know, while most good writers are often good writers because they have good editors. And and I and and, yeah. and the worst writers, really I found this the worst academics who try to write are the ones who don't think they need editors. And you know, that's yeah. that's mistake number one. So um, you know, pride, arrogance, I mean, humility is an important part of, of mm -hmm. writing, of being a good writer. So, yeah. so, you, so you mentioned St. Ambrose in there, in Iowa? Yeah. That, that's where you in Iowa, from? yeah. Okay. So I went okay. for my undergrad, yeah. So I kind of, I commuted, you know, lived at home and commuted, and uh, I did business there. Um, so, and I helped out when I was there, you know, I played some tennis, and I was on the, we had a pro-life club, so. But we're kind of the minority, you know, a lot of these Catholic universities, unfortunately, you know, that are you know, nominal in, in name, you know, you, you have to fight for your faith there. You know, I think Fulton Sheen had a quote. He said, it's better to send your kids to a public school where they can defend their faith than to a Catholic school where they'll lose their faith, you know, and, and, and uh, there's, you know, something to be said about, you know, there is some really great Catholic schools, but there's other ones where you definitely feel the, the, the persecution, and, uh, and I felt it when I was in my undergrad. Yeah. I had my um, student assistant a few years ago left a major Catholic college in Pittsburgh. You can probably guess what it is because she was tired of being attacked for her faith there. And yeah. she said, I'd rather go to a college like Grove City, which is Christian but not Catholic, where, um, yeah. where, where I, she actually felt that her faith was more respected here than, than yeah. at that Catholic college. But, but St. Ambrose, I, I I don't even know where it is. Where, where in where in Iowa is it? Yeah, right? yeah. So it's it's in uh, Davenport, Iowa. So the, it's so the Quad yeah. Cities. You know, yeah. That's, okay, and it and I take it um, it's not on the Cardinal Newman list of recommended. No, it's not. It's not. No. Yep. All right. I guess we'll <laughs> maybe I'll, I'll keep praying. I think they have a really good chaplain. I don't. I don't really, since I moved away from that, I don't follow it too much, but uh, I'm hoping, I mean, there's some, there's a couple, I had a couple friends that one became a nun when I was there. So, I mean, there's, there's some really good pockets of Catholicism, you know, from, I think it's really from the parents raising their children to go there and, and they're strong in their faith. So. Right. Right. So, okay. So you're, you're a marketing person, you're moonlighting as a writer and you realize you're staying up late at night uh, writing and, um, so the, and, and you said you did a book on, on miscarriage. Is that correct? I didn't that's, know. That's, that's correct. Yep. Yeah, so it's a, it's a book called nursery of heaven. And I oh, co-authored right. it with, an, with another, um, author, Cassie Everett. And she's had, uh, oh, she has right. a miraculous, yeah, miraculous story. And she's been on EWTN with the book. She had right. five miscarriage, five miscarriages. And, and then now she has five children, you know, three biological and then two adopted. And, uh, so we, we wanted to tell the story of the saints in there too. And I think, you know, like St. Gianna and then St. Therese's parents, you know, just dealing with child loss. And then also just, we have all these stories of, you know, just people that have lost children, you know, at stillbirth. And then there's some beautiful prayers in there. And then I think it's really a great resource for priests to have too, to know what to say to couples. Um, so it's, it's really, I, I think, you know, people don't realize, but I mean, in your pre-Cana classes, they don't talk a lot about child loss. And it's probably, I would say it's the that and finances. I mean, those are the number two, right. you know, um, factors that, that lead, you know, there's the, 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 sorry, the statistics are pretty high on divorce for people that have miscarriages. I think it's like you're 20% higher, more likely to have a divorce if you've had a miscarriage. So, I mean, it's really, it's a, it's a real struggle. And I think our, our, our goal in writing this book was to help couples to find healing, so. Yeah. So Cassie had five. Is that right? I didn't know that. That's correct. Yeah. And, yeah. Um, my wife had at least four. I I, yeah. I thought it was five, but she corrected yeah. me that it's four. And, you know, she would know, right? She would know better yeah. than me. But, but um, I mean, the first one's the hardest. The first one was at 17 weeks. Yeah. And, yeah. and you know, they, they were, they weren't as far along after that, but it's really hard. And we had yeah. We have eight kids, two yeah. two are adopted, and we, you know, yeah. we, we would obviously have had more, right? But that's, yeah, uh, yeah so yeah. Uh, yeah. Nurs Nursery of Heaven, it's called. Nursery yeah, of yeah, that's Nursery of Heaven. I'm sorry to hear about that, Paul. And and uh, we have a Facebook page, Cassie posts stuff, it's just Nursery of Heaven Facebook. And the other day, I, you know, um, there was this beautiful homily we shared. This happened last month. 
and this was in Wisconsin, there was a, a lady that had a stillbirth and um, the blessed mother actually appeared to this, this young girl and was holding her child in her arms and says, said like uh, something like, I will take, you can find the story, the homily on our, on that Facebook. It says, I will take care of this child, just like I took care of your son. And like, wow. do not, do not, do not be afraid. And, uh, I mean, this lady, you know, she saw this happen in, in daylight and, uh, but I, I believe, you know, that that's uh, the image of our book has the image of our lady with the children. And, uh, so we had our friend, Michael Corsini paint that image, but and that's, I believe, you know, that that's what happens in heaven. You know, I, I haven't seen my children in heaven. I'm at, my wife's had dreams of them, but I, I do believe that they're, you know, they're in the nursery of heaven with, with our lady. Um, so. yeah. I, I don't think of it enough, but I do think of it from time to time. I mean, yeah. imagine so that 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 you know. Hopefully, if I get to heaven someday, and I'm maybe there yeah. to for my wife and other kids, and and there will be four or five there, and one of them will look just like my daughter Amanda, right? One of and and so I'll say, yeah. these are the kids, right? These these are the kids that 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 didn't make it out of the womb. So it's yeah, it's yeah. a really powerful thing to yeah. think. And yeah, it, it happens I, I, everybody. How, what percentage of women have miscarriages? I, I think it. Yeah, it's, it's a lot. It's like I think it's twenty to thirty percent, or maybe even more than that. Um, yeah, yeah. And you and you see a lot of these uh, Hollywood stars that are like really opening up. They're sharing their their loss of stillbirth and miscarriage, and it kind of. I almost think the more we grieve and 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 our miscarriages than these people do it kind of eventually it can turn the tides of abortion because they're seeing the connection now, you know, but it, it takes a while, but I, I'm hope I'm praying that, you know, um, that, that does happen. That's a great point. I mean, if there could be such yeah. an outpouring of sympathy as there would indeed by the culture at large, for women who've lost children through miscarriage, right? But you're yes. never going to have Planned Parenthood or Chelsea Handler or, some kind of angry feminists come and say, well, that's not really a child, right? You know, they're not, yeah. they're not going to do that for a miscarriage, right? Yeah. It would be vulgar. It'd be too insensitive. Uh, but, but getting them to acknowledge the humanity of that child in the room and that loss, then you just easily say, okay, well, what about the aborted ones, right? Yeah. You know, they don't want to go there. They don't want to go there, but, but you follow the logic and that's, that's a great point. I mean, it's very much, this is very much a pro-life thing. So, so that book was published then by which publisher? So that was the company that I started, Contemplative Heart Press. So I published that. That would have been in 2019. And we, we, so in October 2019. So Contemplative Heart Press, is that still operating? No? It, it is. Um, I, don't, I don't really, now that I work at TAN, I don't operate it as much. But I do have, you know, that book, uh, Nursery of Heaven, and then another children's book through them. Yep. Okay. Okay. So, all right. You, you, so you did that and then you came to TAN when? I don't, I actually don't know the answer to these. Yeah. Questions. Yes. Oh. So I started in TAN in, in January, this past January. And, uh, you know, sadly, as you know, the, uh, the former editor, John Morehouse uh, died right. unexpectedly. And uh, so there was a, a role that was opening that opened up. Uh, so yeah, I've been here since January. Okay. And had you, uh, so you, you obviously, this book was in the works, right? I mean, you were, you, I mean, this, yeah. this must yeah. take years to write, uh, yeah. more than a second. So, so you, so you kind of came to Tan probably through that book, right? Or maybe you knew. Yeah. Brian, yeah. Or yeah. Yeah. You know, actually that, that book, um, so it was funny a couple of years ago, you know, I, I presented the idea when I hadn't finished writing, you know, I was in the middle of it. I said, I was interested. I wanted Tan to publish it. And then I think, um, a lot of times with production schedules, they're booked. So they'll tell authors, Hey, we're, we're booked. So, um, you know, that was all I heard. We're not interested. And so then I just decided to self publish it in November, or this past November. And I, I didn't really promote it that well, you know, um, I sent it to a couple, you know, like Jason Everett, I was able to speak on his show, but, and then, you know, when I came for my interview, I said, you know, uh, you know, here's my book and I just want to share it with you. And I think that, that does happen a lot at TAM. We also get a lot of, we, we publish a lot of um, self-published books. So we're going to publish this this great book called Terror of Demons by Kennedy Hall. He mm -hmm. self-published it. So, uh, I mean, ideally, it's, it's nice if you can just have a, a, a publishing company just take over the book, you know, like, you know, in the manuscript stages, you know, because there's more costs, you have a higher cost when you, when you um, self-publish. Right. So, um, so, um, that that um that was one uh, 
so that was a factor. Uh, but but I, I do think that there is a room, you know, I, I want to encourage like writers that, you know, that get rejected by, you know, big companies to, you know, to persevere and to, you know, even to self-publish it. And, and then, you know, if that's still in your heart, you know, sometimes send it to a, you know, um, you know, like a, someone like Tan or Ignatius Press as well. So, Right, right. And, you know, I used to say probably 20, 30 years ago, b- before self-publishing was possible, right, that about 99% of book manuscripts never get published, right? Yeah. But now because of this new technology and self-publishing, you can do that, right? You can get your book published. Yeah. but. But that doesn't mean that it's going to get in the bookstore, that it's going to get read, that it's going to get noticed. So, yeah. you know, if you've got something good enough for, for a publisher like Tan Books or another publisher, go for it. Try it, right? Try it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. definitely. So, so all right. So, so th- this, is, um, this is an impressive book. And I, I didn't even, I didn't even know that you had done it until we were talking on the phone about three weeks ago, right? That, that you were working on this. And this is, um, this is dense. I mean, there's, uh, yeah. this is almost 400 pages. In fact, it's 380 mm-hmm. and it is, um, right? It's not, it's not big wide margins, big spaces, not double spaced on the pages. I mean, this is, uh, I told you in the email, I, I consider it scholarly. I mean, this is, it, it's, it's not, um, I, I, so I thought first parents of the saints, all right, this is going to be a book going to be, but this is how I would have written it, right? There's going to be probably like 12 chapters, maybe 20 chapters, each with a different set of parents. Right. And then each is kind of like a biographical biographical profile, but um, but that's not how you organize it. You organize this in a really interesting kind of thematic, I would almost say academic way, but I don't want to scare people away from buying the book, right? <laughs> but, but it's it's a, it's a, it's a very thoughtful thematic yeah. um, organization. So ex- explain how, how you organize how you organize. Yeah, yeah. So the book is organized into seven hallmarks, and that is what this. I was literally walking on a golf course with my wife and we had just been married uh, you know, a few months and like the Holy spirit just put this book on my heart out of nowhere. It's like this, like this idea came and I'm like, what would the topics be as I started praying about it? And it was these seven hallmarks and, and the seven hallmarks all begin with an S and I, I wasn't like, I was, I, I do like alliteration, but it just happened to be, you know, so we start with an S. I didn't notice that. Yeah. Yeah. Right. With, so we, we start with the, the sacramental life. And then we have sacrificial love, uh, surrender, suffering, simplicity, solitude, and the sacredness of life. And so, yeah, yeah. yeah. and uh, I so think the lucky number know, seven of all things are like seven sacraments, right? That's right. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. And Good. and I want to outline too in the beginning of the book. I mean, there's other sign, you know, like hallmarks. I mean, you could even talk about humility. And uh, courage. I mean, there's so much, so many other things, but these ones were just the themes as I was reading this book. Yeah. Uh, you know, and I wanted, you know, I love Mother Angelica, and she said, you know, she's like, I, I wish you many years in purgatory for those who, you know, sugarcoat the lives of the saints. Wow. So this was really important when I was writing this book. I didn't want to just. I have mostly the good in here, but I also wanted to put in a few things that parents, they made mistakes on. And I wanted to show that, you know, sometimes we, we ideal, we put the um, saints on a, on a pedestal that we can never emulate them. And I think this way you see like, Hey, they were human. They had kids that fell away from the faith, like Padre Pio's, you know, mom and dad, you know, they had one of their daughters left the faith. And right. sometimes you only think, Oh, they only raised a saint, but they had other ones. And uh, so I think that the way that I wanted to write the story is, it was, it was very painful, but, it, uh, you know, going around those topics, cause it just took me, it took me like three years to write, but I, I think, and uh, one of the things we did at the end, I did at the end of the book was put an index. So it is kind of tough as you're reading, you yeah. kind of don't know which saint is who, but you can kind of tell by the last name, but the index in the back of the book also kind of spells out who they are. Uh, but I think it leaves an element of mystery as you're reading it. So there's little, you know, you, some of them, you know, I do talk about St. Therese's parents the most, and that's because I had the most the most information on them. So oh, is that right? Okay, I was going to ask yeah. if they were a favorite, right? Um, they, they actually they they are a, they are my favorite, and I think the reason is you know because I kind of had that experience you know when I left religious life, and I think a lot of people can vouch for this. You know when they discern out of this priesthood or 
you know, not the priesthood, but the seminary. I mean, they, but when they leave the seminary or a convent, you know, and, and I was just in the, I wasn't even in final vows. So, but you kind of have this sense of like, what next Lord? And, and there can be a sense of like, you know, you don't want to disappoint God. And, and I think St. Therese's mom, like on her wedding night, she was in tears. She's literally like, she just wanted to be a nun so bad. And her older sister was a nun. And, and I think, Eventually, when she got married and she had kids, she's like, I, I do not regret having children. And so I think that was the connection that I had just because, you know, I had this ideal of religious life growing up um, wow. from my from, from high school and college. And I, you know, and, and I think by writing this book, I wanted to show the world that you know, marriage is not a second class uh, vocation. You know, it's uh, we need we need holy parents. You know, this is such a powerful example. So, so yeah. St. Therese's mother was named. Zell, Zell, uh, I think it's Azeli is the pronoun, but Zell, Zelli. Yeah, I wasn't sure how to pronounce it. Um, and the last yeah. name is Martin. Z- it's often pronounced like Martin, right? Yeah. I believe. And yeah. and her father's name was um, uh, Louis. Okay. Yeah. Louis, Louis and they were Louis and, and Louis, Louis and they were yeah and they were canonized in uh, 2015. Um, I think October 18, 2015. So think of what a powerful example this is. So um, yeah. Zelly, or how, however you say her name, the mother. So she she had initially thought that she should have stayed in a convent and not had children, but she does have children. One of them becomes Saint Therese, who's um, a doctor of the church, of That's all right. things, right? And and you know, one one of one of the most um, renowned saints of the last hundred fifty years. She's a doctor of the church, right? Um, correct, correct, yeah. And uh, was she been the first? You know, there's Catherine of Siena. There's also the Pius, Sir Pius VI did. Um, I can't remember when she was made uh, Doctor of the Church. Yeah, there's Catherine of Siena. There's Teresa of Avila, Therese right. of Lisieux, and then I think, and then Pope Francis. I don't think it was Pope Francis. Pope Benedict did uh, Saint Hildegard. So there's four of them. Right, yeah. yeah, exactly. Yeah, yep. So, so she, so she, um, so Zelly goes. She decides to get married, has kids. One daughter becomes no less than St. Therese. She and her husband are both canonized, right? Um, and right. Then, then another daughter, I think, is is a venerable or... or yeah, yeah. Therese. One of her is, and I mentioned that in the book, her most troublesome daughter, Leone, is, who was actually like kicked out of school three times, is her cause is open for canonization. And she became a visitation nun. Four of the sisters became Carmelites. And then the one daughter became, uh, Leone became a visitation. And then they also lost four children, two sons. They were named Joseph and they wanted those two sons to be priests. That was kind of their, they always dreamt of having a son that'd be a priest. And this is interesting. This is why St. Therese is literally the vocations director for, I mean, pretty much you can ask any vocations director in any diocese, like she's our unofficial vocations director. She brings in more vocations to the priesthood by her prayers because she always wanted a a little brother. She wanted to, she knew like it was her older brothers were going to be priests. Her parents had a dream of that. So she always dreamt of having a brother as a priest. So in a mysterious, so in a mysterious way, she intercedes for, you know, you hear stories about young men going to the seminary and says, yeah, St. Therese was the one that interceded for me. Uh, So so there, um, ultimately it was all girls in that family, right? So did the boys, the five five surviving girls, and then they had two girls that died and then they had two boys that died. So total of nine children they had. Wow. And, and so think about this, folks. If, if, so if Therese's mom had stayed in the convent, and there's you know, nothing wrong with that, right? I mean, we, yeah. we want nuns. We want, we want women to go to the convent. But, but she felt called to something different, right? So it depends mm-hmm. where you're called for, and discernment is hard to figure out. Um, they, that, it can be very difficult. But she went on and got married, and, and look at this. That's why we're having this conversation today. Right, that's because of the literal saints that 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 she that she formed. Right, so so yeah, that seems to be your your maybe your favorite case of, of parents. It, by the way, you you had mentioned parents who made mistakes. Yeah, um, maybe I hadn't seen that yet. Do you, yeah. do you have any examples of yeah. those? Yeah, well, even even Saint Teresa's parents, even they, you know, their daughter, Leone, the reason why she was such a problem child is because they had a maid servant at the time, not because they were super wealthy. I think they were, you know, upper middle class, but I mean, both parents worked at the time. They had, Zelly had a lace making business and then Lewis had a watch making business. Eventually he 
quit his watchmaking business to help his wife because it was more profitable, but they needed like, you know, a couple servants, you know, I think it was one servant to help the family. And one of the servants was uh, manipulating um, Leone. So that was the, um, the issue there. And, and they, they didn't know um, that that was going on. So, and, and so that was Wait, the reason she why did what to Leone? She, she, she was kind of manipulating her, oh, you know, oh, like kind of, oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And I don't know if it was physical abuse or it was definitely emotional abuse. And then they found out like why, because Leone would never listen to her parents, but she'd only listen to the maid servant. And they found out that there was, uh, that was the reason why. So, so they, they kind of just, they missed that opportunity, you know, and, 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 right. Um, and I think another example was um, St. Teresa of Avila's parents, like they, her mother loved like romance novels. And, mm-hmm. and, and so St. Ter- Teresa of Avila, like would end up reading her mom's novels. And I, th- I think just, and that kind of um, changed her desires, you know, a little bit. She became more worldly, secular, mm-hmm. kind of dressed up with makeup. And then mm-hmm. she also had a cousin that was very um, uh, nefarious and, and that, that, cousin uh, kind of influenced her. So I, I think just the fact that even the most saintly parents, they can, right. you know, that they make mistakes. They, they oversee things. Um, it it kind of gives, not that like you take comfort in that. You kind of, in a sense, you do take comfort in that because you're like, Hey, no one is a perfect parent. Um, yeah. So Teresa's family, they weren't just floating around on little clouds with halos around. around correct. The right. Yeah. So, correct. Like, like we envision the, um, Another family. So there's so many that I that I have written yeah. down. But but you already mentioned um, Saint Gianna Beretta Mola, I think in passing. And um, my family feel, feels close to her. My my daughter's name is Gianna Maria, and she's named for Saint Gianna. By the way, I've noticed Patrick in the last few years. My wife and I have. Gianna has become a popular name, and um, just in the culture at large. And, and I mean, not just among Catholics, I'm not quite sure where this is coming from. I, I mean, sometimes people just like the way a name sounds or is spelled there. There's also, I think her name is Giada, right. From, from the food network. She's Italian. She cooks. Yeah. Okay. I saw her, yeah. I saw her name for a while. That name is being used for a while. I haven't mm-hmm. seen that one as much lately, but Gianna is increasingly popular. And I don't know, maybe it started in part by a lot of Catholics using the name Gianna Beretta Mola, but, 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 but so she was, I want to say she died around 1962, something like that. Mm-hmm. She, and, and so we think a lot about her and her making the choice to, to deliver her child, have that child and that, that child, um, her name, she's around today. She speaks all the time. Why can I think of her name? Yeah, yeah. I think, I think her name, I think I want to say she was named after her mother, yeah, Gianna Ma- Emanuela. Yeah, yeah that, is, that is it. That is it indeed. But the, I had never thought of Gianna, I always thought of Gianna Beretta Mola and her husband as parents, of course, as her, as the saint. And the fascinating, I think she was maybe the first one in history. I should read your opening page. It's really interesting. But she was the first saint in history who's like father and children were at her canonization, right? Yeah. Yeah. So I, that, I, that was, um, let's see, I think that I may have confused you on that. That one in the in, intro is a blessed, there's a blessed Chiara. So that blessed Chiara, Chiara Bad, Badano, she's Badano. pretty recent. She, she mm-hmm. was born, I want to say in the eight, 79 or 80, 1980, pretty recently, but her parents were at the canonization and she died of cancer, you know, as a teenager. Yeah. Um, okay. Here, but, but Gianna. Gonna... Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. All right, you can go ahead. Yeah. I want to get this way. This is. I thought this was really cool. It's a great way to start the book. June twenty fourth, nineteen fifty, marked the first time in the church's history that a mother would attend the canonization of her own daughter, the eleven year old Italian martyr Saint Maria Goretti. Now that's interesting, and uh, we can talk about her. September twenty fifth, two thousand ten marked the first time in the church's history that both a father and mother would attend the beatification of her own daughter, Blessed Chiara Luce Badano. Unlike Maria Goretti, who was stabbed to death, Chiara suffered from a lengthy bout of terminal cancer that ended her life at only 18. She's a very modern saint, right? So she was canonized by Benedict XVI. Mm-hmm. Um, on October 28 or October 18, 2015, marked the first time in the church history that a husband and wife were canonized together. Saints Louis and Zelie Martin, the holy couple, is not as widely known as their as their daughter, Saint Therese of Lisieux, 
who's one of the church's greatest saints and one of only four female doctors of the church. So, yeah, so those are some different examples. But um, but but back to Gianna Beretta Mola. So again, I mean, you know, we think of her as a mother, we think of her as a parent and so forth, but I never thought of, I wonder what Gianna Beretta Mola's parents were like. And you talk about them. Tell us a little bit, tell us a little bit about them. Yeah. I, want to, I believe her father was Alberto and I can't think of the mother's name. There's so many in the, in the book, sure. but the one thing that was, that was fascinating about them is they lived near a, a Capuchin friary. And so the father would get up early and go to mass in the morning and then he'd go to work and then his, you know, the wife would get up and, you know, she would serve her husband, kind of make him a meal. And then, you know, after, again, after mass, and then she would go to the second mass later with the kids and they, you know, the walking distance, the Capuchin Friary. And, um, and then in the evening time, what was most, I think one of the things that, that kind of influenced me the most in this book was the way that Alberto would take time to have a family meal with his children. And he would ask them about their day. And then if there was any, any issues surf- surface, like, you know, he would kind of correct that fault. And, uh, and then I believe he liked to smoke a cigar at the end of the day, but he just, he really got to know his children, you know, and I think in our culture today, there's very few like family meals, you know, people are running to the soccer practices. And I, th- I think the more we know our children, you know, the better, you know, we get to know them, you know, how their, how their day went. And uh, so th- that really influenced me a lot. And, you know, the um, Gianna Mola, all of, all of her siblings became like very successful. I think she had one, one sister that became a nun. She also had, uh, I think I want to say there was a priest and doctor um, so it's a very, and, and I think that was attributed to the fact that the father took the time to know the children, you know, he influenced them, didn't really steer them in a direction. And it was interesting too, that I, I don't think I mentioned this book, but Gianna was praying in Novena. She was, a, I think she was about to become like, a, she wanted to become a nun and go to, I want to say it was Brazil somewhere. And then on the last day of the Novena, it was like, she became clear, like you're supposed to be called to marriage. So, um, wow, wow. The, the so this is on page twenty six and and I commend you yes. too for remembering these details. Yeah. A lot of these Italian families we were talking before this started, and you asked me what my what, what my ethnic background yeah. was. Um, my mom's one hundred percent Italian, and so it's interesting how many of these Italian families of this era had eight, ten, eleven kids, and everyone got up at like five a.m. The mother and the father and went to mass, and I, I, I yeah. it's just. The hardship, and, and of course, they had to walk there, right? <laughs> but, but they but they did it. And this is this is Saint Gianna, okay? And she is, I think, describing it herself. What's the stores? I believe. What's well, from a book by Ignatius Press? Okay. Oh yeah, this is Gianna speaking. Mama was really the valiant woman of the scriptures. Her day began early at five a.m when Papa awoke to go to early mass and begin his day's work before the Lord and in the Lord's name. He went alone, 5 a.m., right? Because Mama stayed home to to prepare breakfast and in a small lunchbox, his midday meal. When Papa left work for Milan, so that's Milan, Italy, more than Italy, Mama passed through our bedrooms to awaken us, caressing our faces, right? Just imagine this. We knew that shortly, and I think there's 11 kids or something like that, right? Mm -hmm. We knew that shortly she would go to church to assist at Holy Mass, and we dressed quickly to go with her, Mm -hmm. happy to kneel beside her to prepare ourselves to receive Jesus in Holy Communion and to make our thanksgiving with her. What marvelous words she would suggest we tell Jesus. Then we would return home, have breakfast, and be off to school. Families that live this way today are made fun of. Right, I, I, or, or called like um, crazy devout or something, but but this was this was not atypical of of families in Italy and France, Germany, and a lot of these countries at that time. It's really sad to see the, the, what what once was, and you know, with the culture and so much of the West. Hilaire Belloc said, "the the faith is Europe, and Europe is the faith." And, you know, Europe isn't very faithful today, but at one point in time, and again, especially with these, so many of these Italian families, this, this was this was pretty typical of how people yeah. were. Yep. Uh, yeah, definitely. I mean, I think that that's, 
the devotion to the Holy Eucharist is what was, you know, passed on to these children. You know, when they, when they saw their parents praying at mass, it's like they believed in the real presence, not just by, you know, by faith and by tradition, but also by their parents' body language. And you can tell if something's real or not, you know, if you're going through the motions and, and I, you know, you see it the way, you know, just the way our culture is, you know, the respect you have towards, you know, even a symbol like the flag, you know, like if your child sees that, like the respect, you're like, wow, like I have respect for our country, our soldiers in, in the same way, you know, for these sacraments. And a lot of these parents, they're not intellectuals, they're, they're farmers, yep. right? Yep. They're what we today would call like blue collar working class folks. And yep. um, I mean, it's sad, read Charles Murray's book, Coming Apart about the kind of um, detonation of the white working class in America today, where um, they're not even they're not even married. The, the children that they have are a, a massive percentage are out of wedlock. And at one point in time, you had people far poorer and they were having eight, 10, 11 kids and they would get up like this at five o'clock in the morning. The mom would go around and caress their faces. Father had already gotten up and you know walked up the hillside to go to mass. It's um, it, uh, while this is inspiring, a, a lot of the, a lot of times it's kind of depressing to me to see what used to be and what's gone now. And, you know, yeah. what I, I don't know. the whole point yeah. is the whole point of tan books, right. Is that maybe we can do more of this in the future, right. We can, we can yeah. have people like this in the future. Yeah, no, I definitely. I think even like Padre Pio's parents were, you know, peasants, they were uneducated. You look at Maria Goretti's, St. Bernadette's, you know, and I think that it's also consoling to know for parents, because I think a lot of times you think, well, if, if I don't have like a, a master's in theology from, you know, somewhere, you know, the Angelicum or Franciscan or, you know, any other, you know, Christendom that, you know, that I can't be the best teacher of, of my child. And, and that's, you no, know, you are the best child, you know, the best teacher. And you don't, it, it, yes, it's helpful to have a degree. And as parents, we need to continue our education but, you know, by reading books and praying, you know, through meditation, prayer. Um, but it also, it's, it's just a lesson for us that really that God works through the humble and simple people, you know, people with strong faith and, and really getting, I mean, I know it's kind of cliche, but it, it is like getting our children to heaven is more important than Harvard. You know, if our mission in life is to get our children in to the best college, we, we, we failed, you know, because, you know, if you can imagine where our kids will be a trillion years from now, I mean, that, that's the destination. Is it heaven or hell? Right. And, and, you know, like a trillion years from now, like, is it really getting into that college? Did, does that matter? Or does giving our children the faith, you know, passing on our love for the rosary, for our lady, you know, these are the things that these parents, you know, they, they were the salt of the earth people. That, that's why I think they wanted to be hidden, you know, as, as, you know, and I think in our culture, it is, it's tough, you know, because, you know, like we're always told to, to, be, to go out there and love our careers more than our families to be, you know, to be um, money hungry. And, and I feel like these parents were the opposite. They just, you know, they're very simple, dedicated uh, souls. So I got to read this quote. This is one of my favorites. Yeah. This is from Father yeah. uh, Thomas Dubé. And this yeah. is um, on pages eight to nine of the book. There are yeah. two, and I think it goes exactly what you were just talking about. There are two kinds of human excellence, the first of which is on the level of natural talents, gifts, accomplishments. These occur in many areas and to differing degrees, intelligence, scholarship, literature, music, art, sports. And really, that's, that's, where, that's where parents are focusing on excellence today, right, by and large, in kind of the Western secular culture. Sure. The second and higher type lies on the level of personal goodness, integrity, virtue, sanctity. It goes back to Tan Book's mission, right? We want to cultivate these things, right? Those, those virtues. Here we find the beauties of selfless love, humility, honesty, patience, chastity, fidelity, generosity. And he, said, and he adds, it's immediately obvious that someone can be eminent in the first area of talents and accomplishments, and yet a moral wretch in the second. There are, however, few who excel in both levels, Augustine, Thomas Aquinas, Catherine of Siena, Teresa of Avila. It should be obvious to a consistent theist that to be a saint is immeasurably more important than to be a world-class scholar, violinist, or an Olympic gold medalist. It's very good, spot on. Yeah, so, absolutely. 
you you had um i'm watching the clock because we keep these under two hours we're under an hour and <laughs> wow is the time flying we got like 10 minutes so there's so many people i wanted to hit here but i had mentioned before um you had mentioned um parents who made mistakes and i said i don't remember seeing mistakes but now i do and you just mentioned maria garetti was Maria Goretti the one whose father insisted that the family move to where they moved to? And then yes, yep. that was where Maria got raped. Yes. Right? Yes. Yeah. She, she was actually, she prevented the rape. You know, she said, you're going to go to hell. So the, the gentleman tried to, Alessandro tried to rape her and thankfully he was unsuccessful, but, um, and, and so they had some issues. They, they had moved away from their family because of, I think they were already destitute and they're looking for a better, you know, better life to provide for his family. And so right. they moved to another area of Italy that was a warmer climate. And then the father ended up getting, I think it was malaria. He died of some kind of sickness. Mm -hmm. And then the, and, and before he died, he goes, he told his wife, he goes like return, you know, return to their hometown pretty much. And uh, the wife didn't have the means. She had like five children, like under the age of, it was like 10 or maybe 13, sorry, with Maria Gretti. And, uh, and she kept the children there. And then they became sharecroppers with this other family. And that's, and they shared the same common area with this family with Alessandro, who ended up, you know, trying to kill Maria Gretti. And so I think, um, you know, I think the mother felt guilty too. Like, you know, she wishes she would have heeded the husband's, you know, warning, but, you know, to head back. Right. Um, but, 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 but it was but like that was, deathbed wish, right? Like, you know, yeah, please yeah. Go, go back home. Go and home. The, yeah. yeah. And the father had, they didn't really want to leave. People in the community didn't want them to leave, but he felt he had to leave for financial reasons. Yeah. And yeah. he got there and man, is it a mistake, right? Um, I mean, he, he gets malaria. The guy died from it. I mean, yeah. and, 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 and think, and the people watching this think about what these families went through. I, I, I yeah. mean, there are so many people today who, when um, when a trial happens in life or a family loses somebody, they lose their faith. These these people didn't lose their faith. I, I mean, you know, yeah. these kinds of trials, travails, this is just part of life. They knew that, I mean, they lost multiple children, multiple children. Yeah. So Maria yeah. Green's mom loses her husband and, and whose deathbed wishes, you know, take the kids home. But she can't because she can't afford to, right? Um, yeah. She can't afford to buy a ticket or go. Or there's not even yeah. you can't get there. And then yeah. of all things, her, 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 what happens to her daughter happened to her daughter. And and I think Patrick that all the kids right ended up being raised by somebody else, and the poor mom died. Alone. Yeah, I, th I think they yeah yeah they put the kids up for adoption. I believe some of them put in some orders, and I think some of them uh, emigrated to the United States. And then it was inter you know then. Um, the gentleman that, you know, that killed Maria Gretti, like he ended up going after he got, you know, uh, I think he got, uh, was released from parole and he ended up visiting Maria Gretti's mother, right. you know, on, it was like Christmas Eve. And, and she goes, well, if Maria can forgive you, then I can forgive you. And that was the toughest probably moment in her life just to say like, do I, am I going to forgive this guy? And, and they uh, went to so mass think, together, right? They yep, together. They did. Yeah, I think it would be did, yeah. John Paul II with uh, Mahmoud Ali Asha, his would-be assassin, right, meaning in prison. And, and you know, the picture of this image of Maria Goretti's mom, who's lost everything. She lost her husband, lost her kids, lost Maria. And there she is, and she's a, she's aside Maria's um, um, killer or murderer, the man who caused her death, right? And, and, and she goes to Christmas Mass with him. Right. Yeah. I, I mean, I mean, you'd be tempted if it was my daughter to be tempted to, to, to strangle the guy. Right. Uh, I mean, how's that? That's a right. <laughs> but, and but, they were both at the, yeah. Yeah. That's they were both at the canon. Oaks. <laughs> <laughs> and they were both at the canonization together, I believe, Maria Goretti's yes. mother and then Alessandro. But, you know, and I think you have a good point. When you look at like John Paul II, a lot of these saints in the chapter I wanted to write the most on was suffering because really, I mean, you look at these countries like Poland, where these saints are, you know, they're raised and it's, they're raised in difficult times. You know, I think when we get in prosperous times, our, our faith becomes comfortable. And, you know, I, I wonder if John Paul II, if he was born, say, in the United States today, would, would he become a saint? And I, I honestly don't think so. I think that right. his adversity made him a saint. And mm -hmm. I think a lot of these saints, the same, same thing happened. So I, I think it's a lesson for us, even me as a parent. You know, sometimes we're like, when we go through suffering, 
I mean, it's really a sign that God loves us, even though at, at the time we don't, we don't see it that way, but it really, um, it kind of detaches us. The more suffering we have, and, and obviously, and I like one thing about St. Therese's mom, she goes, I didn't never prayed for suffering. You know, and I, th- I think it's, you know, I don't know. I, I haven't, I think all of us have enough suffering that, That's you know, awesome. but we just, you know. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. yeah. And yet there are some of these saints, um, uh, Catherine of Siena, Faustina, Gemma, Gemma Galgani, um, who did pray for suffering, right? And and in fact, there's another one from that same era. By the way, Maria Goretti, Gemma Galgani, Padre Pio, you show, they're all born around the same time. Uh, 1878, 1880, 1883. Yeah. Uh, Rez is around that time too. Gemma Galgani, who, who ended up, uh, she died in 1903, I think, and maybe around 25 years old. And she had the stigmata. But she, I think she lost everybody. Didn't she lose her parents, right? And ended yeah. up being raised by somebody else, like um, a wealthy woman in the area. I, I believe, I believe that's correct. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, one more because we're running out of time. Wow, there's some. Patrick, we should do a bunch of these. Do, <laughs> right? In oh, fact, that was great. Thinking, you could, you could, you could do. I mean, every Mother's Day, every Father's Day. You should write something, um, put this out there, oh, you can do an interview, do a press release, yeah. uh, you know, just, uh, just yeah. remind people of something. You, you can you can mine this for the next 50 years. Yeah. I mean, yeah. The material. Um, oh, thank you. Yeah. Quickly on Padre Pio, can you, can you tell us about him? Because his, um, his father came to America, yeah. right? Yep. He came to America twice, I think. One was it. One time was in um, Pennsylvania, I believe. The other time was in New York, and he did this so his son could. He worked on, I believe, it was one of the railroads to, for his son to be able to um, to go to seminary. That, that was the whole purpose. Yeah. Uh, and that was just, so kind of to come to America to make money to send his to send his son to seminary. Yeah. Um, yeah and, and he, by the way, it's in Western PA. It was in Newcastle, which is about a half hour from yeah. me. I'd love to know what, which house he stayed at. But anyway, go ahead. Yeah, and he even missed his son's ordination mass, um, which is, you know, that, what a sacrifice. I mean, I would be, you know, I, I would, like my brother-in-law this year um, was ordained a deacon in Rome, and we had wanted to go so bad, and, you know, because of COVID, everything was shut down, and I remember watching it on there, and thankfully, we'll, we'll be able to go see his ordination in, in uh, Wisconsin, but it was so painful, and I can't imagine just like, you know, Padre Pio's dad to be at, you know, not to be there for his son. And uh, I also mentioned that in, on St. Jose Maria Scriva, like his own dad died before his ordination mass and uh, his first mass. And just like, you know, it's, it's like a, it's a bittersweet moment, you know, for a son, you know, as a child, you're looking up for the gaze of your father and he's not there at the most important moment of your life. And uh, I think Padre Pio understood his, you know, his father's sacrifice, but, but just, it just kind of shows you, the love that these saints had for their parents. Like they, like Padre Pio was, he was so devastated when his mother um, died that he couldn't even celebrate her funeral mass. Like he was locked up in his room. He loved his mom that much. You know, and I think sometimes we think, Oh, you know, when you lose someone, you know, it's like the saints just kind of moved on with their life, but they had such a, such a profound love for their parents. And I think when God willing, when we get to heaven, you know, hopefully we all met, you know, you, you and I, we make it there and we go up to Padre Pio and I bet Padre Pio almost like, you know, John the Baptist is like, you know, behold the lamb of God. Padre Pio is going to be like, I want you to meet my parents, you know, yeah. like, cause. So. Yeah. My, my probably most common intercessors that I go to, I, Padre Pio, Michael, the archangel. Um, yeah. And, and Padre Pio's mom, you tell about the moving moment where toward the end of her life, she gets down on her knees, right? And she's like kissing his hands or each finger, right? Like 10 times or something like that. Yeah. And, and, and he, and he says no, right. And he tries to, tries to help her up. And. And he said, the son must kiss the mother's fingers. I think that's what he said. You must not yeah. kiss my fingers, but I must kiss yours, you know? Right. But she wanted yeah. to kiss her hands, not just of her son, but but of the stigmata, right? Yeah. And, yep. and and the and and the father. So the mother died before the father, and the father, um, whose name was Gra- uh, Grazio, right? So so the That's father right. ends up living with Padre Pio's um, American friend. He had, Padre Pio had these women. They call they called them the uh, Piedane, the Piedana, the holy women. Yeah. Right? Yeah. The other yeah. Friars kind of made fun of them. Because they were almost like, uh, uh, he was like, uh, they were like fangirls to, to Padre Pio. 
I don't want to make fun of it. But but <laughs> Padre Pio and the other guys will laugh about it too. Some of them could be really effusive, can could be a little crazy. Yeah. But one of the American women who followed him who wasn't crazy um, was Maria Pyle. And and so the father, Grazio, actually lived with her, I think wow. the last few year of his, years of his life, and right. got to spend a lot of time with his son in the in those last few years. But here again, imagine today, folks, right, where so often today the person becomes older and you send them off to a nursing home or wherever. Here was a friend of Padre Pio, Maria Pio said, I'll take your dad. I'll take it. Yeah. And yeah, he took care of him until his dying days. The same way with St. Therese's parents, you know, they took care of their, um, her mother took care of the father-in-law and then her own dad, you know, before they died, they lived with them for the last few years of their life. So that was kind of a lesson that was really inspiring for me to read about that. Hmm. All right. Well, I, yeah, I think we need to wrap this up, but is there, is there anything, I mean, I have a whole bunch of questions. We're not, yeah. we're not <laughs> what, I know. What, I, I think, yeah, go ahead. Well, okay. What, what, what would be for people watching? What, you know, what, what's the takeaway? What, what, yeah. what's the lesson learned here? What's, what's the big picture? Sure. Yeah, sure. And if, if my phone cuts off here, I'm sorry, I, I had the, my, my, my phone was charged up. So it might, it's kind of on the, it's, it's kind of, it might be uh the battery might be oh, dying. Running out of juice? But, uh, All right, we better hurry I'm up. running out of, I see, but I, I'll just say the one takeaway is that, um, you know, it, as parents, you know, never underestimate, you know, the, the role that you have in your children's life, that you are, you know, the primary educator, you are, um, you know, you are that, that hidden hero in their life and all the sacrifices you do now, it may, you know, they may not appreciate that, but someday they will. And, and the greatest thing that you can, you can give to them is, is loving God you know, and, and also loving them as well. And, and just providing that example, you know, like when they see your prayer life, when you go to mass and you're praying the rosary, you know, just that you mean it and not just going through the motions. And, um, and, and I think, and just how God will, he, he wants to make a saint. He wants to make, he wants to make your children saints. And then that's, that's your gift to the world. And if um, more than, you know, having a, a library named after you, even giving your children, you know, uh, a huge inheritance, your goal in life as parent, my goal and your goal should be to form saints because our church and our world needs saints. And, and that's, that's our legacy in life. Now, it doesn't matter whether we're canonized or not. I mean, I mean, it's, it's more important that our children, you know, not that even they, you know, they become saints. That, that's the most important thing. Like we're like a, a John the Baptist, I'm going to point you uh, to Christ. And uh, so that, that's my takeaway is uh, just to, to allow God to work through you uh, to form saints. A spiritual inheritance right, more than anything yeah. else. And the uh, Patrick, you've done something really important here because, yeah. because people think Catholics even think of the saints and they think of them almost in isolation, right? The saint with yeah. God, the saint with Jesus, the saint and the crucifix, the saint and intercessors, the saint in the church. But the saints were children of parents. Uh, and, 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 and as you show here, I mean, a major, major, major part of this for many of these yes. saints, they were born, they yeah. were formed by the parents. Now there were some like Faustina, right. Who literally had to run away from home. Right. But, yeah. but, 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 they, but, but, but mostly they were formed by parents. Yeah. So great job. Great, great job. Yeah. No, thank you. Yeah, no, thank you. And all the saints are how they're all connected to, you know, each of them, you know, even, you know, I think I try to make that um, connection throughout the book. There's so many connections. And, you know, you see even when um, St. Therese's parents were married, um, they were married, I think it was uh, like four months after Our Lady appeared in Lourdes. So so they went to Lourdes for, you know, the, for pilgrimage often for healing. And uh, so that's, that's kind of thing. Just we're not like this, you know, the saints are kind of like, it's like a living rosary. I see it. We're all connected in some way. And uh, God wants us again to, to form saints and that's that's our mission in life as parents. So, Amen. All right. So Patrick O'Hearn, the uh, editor here at Tan Books, Parents of the Saints, and um, Steve Cunningham is our great producer. He's behind yeah. the scenes. He's actually on our screen here too. Patrick and I can see him, but people watching this right now can't. And so Steve is, I'm sure he's been posting pictures and graphics and images of all this stuff. He'll put up information yeah. on how to get this. But you get it at our website, the Tan Books website. Just yeah. go online and go to Tan Books. Yeah. So, and Patrick, in the few, I wanted to talk about upcoming titles and other projects, and 
but uh, we're out of time. Let, let's do that. Let's do that another time, maybe later in the summer. Sound That'd good? be great. Yeah. Thank you so much, Paul, for your book and your amazing book, uh, The Devil and Karl Marx. It's such a gift, you know, so thank you for writing well, that. That's, that's not as that's not an inspiring book. <laughs> uh, and and uh, I'll tell you that there was a, a, a parental failure there in the Marx family. Uh, yeah, yeah, uh, it just shows you what, what one parent. You know, I, I do how parents can make the difference. They can they can change a civilization by uh, you know, just by raising one holy person. So by the way, that's so true. A fascinating contrast would be how Marx was raised compared to. Therese and Padre Pio and some of yeah. those maybe, maybe we need to have parents on the yeah. bad saints. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, how about, <laughs> bad saint, how about yeah. malforming the saints? Par- Mal- That's right. Right, or uh, a yeah. parenting of, um, of, of, of the, you know, the non-saints. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and, very good. Well, thank, right. Dale, thank you thank you so much for having me. And thank you, Steve, for your behind-the-scenes work as well. Steve Cunningham, the great Steve Okay. Cunningham. All okay. right. God, God bless great. you guys. All right. Thanks, Patrick. Take care, okay. everybody. We okay. will see you in another episode in a few weeks. Check out our previous episodes online, YouTube, and wherever you want to find them. Take care. God bless. Okay.